So I need one definition. This is the de this is the notion of what is called Gershkorn disks. So A is a matrix and C to the n cross n, and we define D i to be the set of complex numbers such that Z minus A i i is less than or equal to magnitude of Z minus A i i is less than or equal to sigma J equal to 1 to n J not equal to i Z minus uh, sorry A i j i equal to 1 to up to n. In other words, I am defining a circle. Okay, this is uh, this is the radius of the circle and this is the center of the circle. And uh, so I am defining a, a disk which is centered at a i i and of radius equal to the sum of the magnitudes of the other entries of a in the same row. So that's how I define these disks. So for instance, in this matrix that I showed you as an example, in this matrix, the Gershkorn disks are all the same. They are centered at on the real line at n, at location n, and their radius is equal to n minus 1. So just draw that here so this is 0 this is n and this circle is of radius n minus 1 okay I don't want to draw such a big circle so let me let me raise this 0 this is n let's say this is n minus 1 then I draw a circle here Okay, all the, the it has n disks. Every matrix of size n cross n will have n disks, but all n disks are the same. They overlap in this case. Okay, so now let's um, do, let's write out the theorem. This is also one of these amazing theorems. Uh, again, one of those completely non-intuitive results, uh, at least to me. So A is any matrix in C to the n cross n. Then the eigenvalues of A lie in the union i equal to 1 to n di. Okay, so if you take the union of these Gershkorn disks, all the eigenvalues of A will lie in the union of those disks. Further, if a union of K of the N disks form forms a connected region. See, these disks could overlap with each other. So if suppose K of them form a connected region, that is disjoint 
from the remaining n minus k disks then there are exactly k eigenvalues in the connected region. Okay, so that's what the theorem says. Any questions about the theorem? So I won't go through the whole proof here, um, but I'll just give you a sketch, uh, or rather just the main idea of the proof. So first of all, um, lambda of A are the roots of the characteristic polynomial p a of lambda equal to determinant of a minus lambda i so what that means is that if lambda zero which is a possibly a complex number again i emphasize that we are not dealing with hermitian symmetric matrices so eigenvalues can be complex valued here is an eigenvalue of a then if i look at the matrix a minus lambda 0 i this what can i say about this matrix is singular which implies that it is not, or rather it is not invertible. What that means is that um, the diagonal dominance condition must be violated for some, uh, some index uh, of the diagonal entries. So by the Actually, let me just see. Okay. So the the actual name for this theorem is dominant diagonal theorem, not diagonal dominant theorem. So let me just correct that. So by this uh, dominant diagonal theorem, it must be that the one of the diagonal entries in this violates the diagonal dominance condition. That implies um, mod of the diagonal entry for the the ith diagonal entry will be mod of aii in magnitude will be mod of aii minus lambda zero. This is less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes of the off diagonal entries in the same row, which is just mod of Aij for some i, which means that lambda 0 lies in at least one of the di's okay because if this is true then lambda zero satisfies this meaning that 
Where is that? Over here. Yeah. Lambda 0, if I substitute lambda 0 here, mod of lambda 0 minus AII is less than or equal to this quantity. So it's actually lying inside. So lambda 0, as a, if I replace Z with lambda 0, it satisfies this condition. So lambda 0 belongs to DI. Of course, lambda 0 may belong to other DIs as well. And that's when we say that these disks are overlapping with each other. Okay, so this proves the first part of the theorem. Okay, so we just showed this part. For the second part is where I'm going to sketch the proof, or rather I'm just going to give you a visual proof. Um, so, um, re recall that we said we can write A of epsilon as d plus epsilon b where d contains the diagonal entries of a and epsilon b uh, and, and b contains all the off diagonal entries in in a now the eigenvalues of d are easy to locate and the eigenvalues are just a i i okay and uh, now we use the fact that the eigenvalues are continuous functions of the entries. be within an epsilon neighborhood around the eigenvalues of uh, of d okay so in other words so for example if i in on the two dimensional plane if i had say a11 over here this is the real and imaginary part this is the two dimensional complex plane then a11 may be here a22 was maybe here and a33 is here and a and n is here and so basically um, if epsilon is very small then these radii of these Gershkorin disks will be epsilon times summation aig so there will be small circles around these points those will be the Gershkorin disks and we've already seen that the eigenvalues lie inside these Gershkorin disks now, as you increase epsilon, it's possible that some of these disks will end up touching each other or they end up merging. And so if k of these circles, so as epsilon increases, the radius of these disks, uh, disks increases. But the eigenvalues are always inside these disks. Okay, and so if if k of these circles form a connected region, which is disjoint from k circles or disks, form a connected region that is disjoint from the remaining n minus k disks then those k disks must contain k eigenvalues. Uh, 
Again, this is because the uh, eigenvalues are continuous functions of the entries, and so they cannot suddenly jump to another disk. So th this is the part where I'm doing a bit of hand waving. It requires a little continuity argument. Um, so you can see the text for the full proof. So let's uh, see one simple example. Suppose I have a matrix A, which is equal to 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 2, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 3, 2, and 0, 1, 1, 5. Does this matrix satisfy the um, dominant diagonal theorem? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, for every row, you see that the magnitude of the diagonal entry is strictly greater than the sum of the magnitudes of all other entries in the row. Okay, so we can. Uh, use this uh, Gershkorin disk theorem to show that exactly one eigenvalue of A, one eigenvalue of A is in the left half plane. So what are the Gershkorin disks here? The Gershkorin disks are D1, so D1 is the Gershkorin disk corresponding to this diagonal entry. It is a set of complex numbers Z such that Z minus 2 is less than or equal to the sum of all the other entries here in magnitude, which is 1. D2 is the set of Z such that Z minus uh, of minus 2, which is plus 2, is less than or equal to, again, the sum of all the other um, off diagonal entries in the same row in magnitude, which is 1. T3. Z minus 3, that's the third diagonal entry, is less than or equal to 1 again. And D4 is a set of all Z. Z minus 5 is less than or equal to 4. So if I were to draw these disks on the real line, so Say this is 0 and um, minus 1, minus 2, and this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the first disk is z minus 2 is less than or equal to 1. So it's the circle of radius 1 centered around uh, 2. So I'll draw it like this. Not good at drawing circles. Okay. And this over here and uh, let's say D3. This is at, uh, centered at uh, 
uh, at 3 and radius 1. So that will look like this. And uh, this last one, I'm using funny colors here, D4. This is centered at 5 and as of radius 4. So in fact, it's a big circle like this. So these three circles form a connected region. And this is one distinct uh, region. So there will be one eigenvalue over here and three eigenvalues. And three eigenvalues in this region. And this circle lies entirely in the left half uh, plane and is disjoint from the other three disks. So that's why this um, has exactly one eigenvalue in the left half plane. Okay, so one uh, remark is that uh, Gershkorin's theorem does not say that there is one eigenvalue in each disk. Okay, this is important. This uh, all it says is that every eigenvalue will be in the union of the disks. Okay, um, so pick an arbitrary eigenvalue; it will sit inside the union of these disks. And the further, it says that if k uh, uh, if k of the disks form a connected region which is disjoint from the remaining disks, then there are precisely k eigenvalues in that connected region. That means that this matrix A that we wrote, it could have all three of its eigenvalues over here, for example. It need not be contained in these three disks. Um, now, but there is a corollary, which is that, I'll call it corollary one. If the Gershkorin disks are mutually disjoint, that is DI intersection DJ equals the empty set for all i not equal to j, then it is true that there is um, exactly one eigenvalue in each disk. In other words, when disks merge, it's possible that the eigenvalue passes into the other disk. It need not be in the first disk anymore. But as long as the disks remain disjoint, then there will be one eigenvalue in each disk. There's another corollary. Um, if the Gershkorin disks are mutually disjoint, and the matrix A is real. That is, it has real valued entries, then 
its eigen values must be real anyone wants to reason out why this is the case take a guess what can we say about the characteristic polynomial of a real valued matrix complex conjugate yeah perfect so um, the co coefficients of the real characteristic polynomial uh, are real valued numbers and so the roots of the characteristic polynomial must occur in complex conjugate pairs and so um each of the gershkorin disks are mutually disjoint and they're all centered on the real line so if i take any particular disk like this the roots of the characteristic polynomial since they must occur in complex conjugate pairs if there's a root up here there will be a root down here but then if i mean there must be a root which is in this circle here and if the root has a non zero imaginary part then there will be another root down here and so then it will have two roots inside this gershkorin disk but then we already said in the gershkorin disk theorem that if the disks are mutually disjoint then each disk should contain exactly one eigen value that's not possible and so um each disk must contain only one real valued eigen value okay the next corollary is that um, since a and a transpose have the same eigen values why is this true why do a and a transpose have the same eigen values transpose is similar to they are similar matrices so they must have the same eigen values so um we can use the columns of a to define these gershkorin disks okay and these could yield uh, you know either better or additional information okay there are some examples in the text you can look at but you can see that if you define the gershkorin disks using the rows it will give you a set of gershkorin disks if you define them using the columns it will give you a different set of gershkorin disks because these matrices are not symmetric not necessarily symmetric and so that could um, uh, that could give you some additional information about the location of the eigen values um just one more remark and this is related to this thing about the continuity of eigen values that i've been talking about so suppose a is in c to the n cross n and eigen values lambda 1 to lambda n given any epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if b in c to the n cross n is a matrix such that um mod of aij minus bij is less than delta for every ij so b is a matrix that is within a delta neighborhood of the matrix a then there exists a labeling um mu1 
through mu n of the eigenvalues of B such that mod of lambda i minus mu i is less than epsilon in other words i don't have to consider the eigenvalues of b in uh, see here the eigenvalues of b need not be need not even be real valued and the same holds for the eigenvalues of a so it's just saying that you you can consider the eigenvalues of b in some order such that if you take corresponding entries of so corresponding eigenvalues of a and b and subtract them and look at the magnitude that will be at most equal to uh, the difference will be at most epsilon um, for all i equal to 1 to n okay so basically this this is uh, actually known as the continuity of eigenvalues theorem I'll write it up here and it basically says that if the entries of a are changed by a sufficiently small amount then the change in the eigenvalues is also small. Okay, so one one way to see this is that uh, the eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial P A of lambda. Now this P A of lambda depends continuously on the entries of A. The coefficients are just um, uh, obtained by taking products of uh, products and sums of the entries of a and so it depends continuously on the entries of a and uh, 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 and so uh, this this theorem here the continuity of eigenvalue theorem is actually a consequence of another theorem which says that the roots of a polynomial with complex coefficients depend continuously upon these coefficients and this in turn is related to a famous theorem in analysis called the intermediate value theorem Okay, so um, yeah, so now um, sir, sir, yeah, sir, uh, how small is sufficiently small? So that is hard to say. I mean, that depends on the matrix. So, but what it's saying is that there, there is a delta, which is, uh, which if you choose it small enough, then as long as um, uh, you take any B whose entries differ from the corresponding entries of A by at most delta, then the eigenvalues of B, when considered in some particular order, are such that every eigenvalue of uh, B is within an epsilon neighborhood of the corresponding eigenvalue of A. But how small that delta needs to be is something that depends on the matrix itself. Thank you, sir. And uh, is there any relation between delta and epsilon? No. Um, so the idea is that, I mean, there is a relation, of course, in the sense that if you choose, if you're, you're starting out with an epsilon that is given to you, and corresponding to that epsilon, you're you're, you're choosing a delta. Uh, of course, you can see that if you choose any smaller delta, it will still work. But there will be a biggest possible delta such that as long as you perturb by smaller than delta, the eigenvalues get perturbed by at most epsilon. But if you choose delta by two of that or half of that, that will also work. That will satisfy this condition. So. There is a relationship, but it's more like an uh, epsilon will determine an upper bound on how big delta can be. But again, these are things that uh, these are existence results. And so it just says that there exists such a delta. It doesn't tell you how you will find it, um, nor does it tell you how it depends on the matrix A. Okay, so now in the next class, we will actually look at 
several interesting results that follow as a consequence of this Gershgorin disk theorem. And in particular, um, some results on the condition of eigenvalues, which in turn will tell us how these eigenvalues will get perturbed when you perturb the matrix. So we'll stop here for today and continue on Wednesday.